Is this on? Can you hear me? We good? Okay. Uh, sorry, I was laughing because my sister is here and she's laughing at me during that entire introduction. So just, you know, if you ever get to the point where you're giving such a talk, bring a sibling. It'll really bring your ego right into check. Um, <laughs> so uh, as mentioned, I am the head of, of Culture and Trends, which is quite the absurd title. I will be the first to admit that. Um, and uh, I've, been at, I've been at Google um, and working at YouTube for a little over four years now. Um, I didn't start and when I was at BC. I had no idea that I would ever work in technology. The idea of technology careers was kind of a thing that seemed out of reach because I didn't have like any sort of comp sci background or anything like that. Um, and so, but now I, I have this kind of unique job that sits in a world that exists between kind of engineering and product management and user experience type things, as well as uh, marketing and, um, and other projects and, and PR and stuff. So uh, I do run the culture and trends team, which I only realized after we sort of announced what my team would be called. Uh, it makes me technically the head of cats, uh, which is <laughs> ironic and appropriate. Um, and, uh, but I actually, we, uh, as mentioned, I, sort of, I really focus on how people browse and think about what's popular on YouTube. That's sort of the main um, thing that I work on. And you have to remember, YouTube is, is pretty massive. And I think that's not a surprise to anybody. But you know, it's like the third most popular website in the world and the second, you know, second largest search engine in the world. These are, these are huge things. Um, there's well over 100 hours of video that get uploaded every minute to this, this platform, a billion, over a billion unique visitors every month coming through. Um, and 80% of all that stuff is outside the United States. It's not, uh, it's not mostly happening in the US anymore. It's coming from all over the world. So we think about things in a very global way. Uh, we also have the largest social media following of any brand in the world. Um, for all of our social media accounts for YouTube have, have huge, huge followings from people everywhere. Um, so, and it's, it's not just a big community, it's very, very active, as you can imagine, um, of all the people who are big fans of YouTube and who engage with us regularly. Um, so we do a lot of different work. I'm going to talk through some of the projects that we work on, just so you have a sense for uh, what I do and the kind of things I work on. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I ended up at Google, and then I'll, I'll finish off with some sort of general things I think I learned through that process and, um, and how, you know, I wanna, how I came from Boston College all the way through to, to ending up at Google. And then we'll do some Q&A stuff uh, afterwards. So um, let's, uh, first of all, like amongst the things that we work on, I run the, we, we run the official YouTube channel. We do a lot of different work around figuring out what videos we share and why. And, and a lot of our community projects, we work on Rewind. I don't know if anybody's ever seen Rewind, which is kind of the whole end of the year thing. Uh, this is a clip from last year's Rewind. <laughs> Uh, this video has 100 million views now. Um, <laughs> this is the this this year. I think will be the sixth, fifth or fifth year, I guess, that uh, I've worked on this project for us. We got a whole new set of stuff coming out for the things that were big this year. Um, I also get to work on the April Fool's Day joke every year, um, which is one of my favorite things to do because uh, I used to do comedy in college and, and uh, afterwards even. Uh, this is a clip from um, our April Fool's Day joke this year. Gangnam Style, Trampoline Fails, Rebecca Black. Inventing, producing, and spreading every single viral video that has ever been popular on the web. It's what we do here. Since 2005, YouTube has been behind the scenes of all your favorite video trends, meticulously crafting every single moment of every viral video ever. And this year, we're doing it even bigger. We're about to unveil the exciting viral video memes we have planned for 2014. And for the first time ever, we're going outside YouTube's writing staff to let the public come up with their own meme ideas. Stick around and find out how. So let's get to it. Here are YouTube's video trends for 2014. The viral videos you and your friends won't be able to stop talking about. First up, clocking. So we're really excited about this one. Basically, clocking is when people go somewhere and film themselves holding up their arms like their hands on a clock and slowly move them around to correspond with the time. So people around you are like, what? See, the longer you stand there in place, the funnier and cooler it is. It's going to be even bigger than clocking. Big changes. So, uh, you, do, you, know, you know you're living a very strange life when the, there's a parody version of your job in an internet April Fool's Day joke, um, which is sort of what this guy is. Um, this is uh, we did this with The Onion uh, last year, so we get to work with The Onion on these things. Uh, as mentioned, I've also been working on this project with DreamWorks this year. We've had a show that we've been producing 
um, out of Los Angeles called YouTube Nation. Um, and uh, we also work on a lot of different things around what we call user experience, right? So we're specifically trying to use uh, different approaches to curation, to, um, to content discovery, we call it, to basically improve how you browse YouTube. So you think about the different ways that people use YouTube, right? You maybe you get, uh, you, you're coming to search for something specific or you get a link in you know, a social media feed or an embed in a website or something. Maybe you have subscriptions for channels you like. And then there's like the idea of just coming to browse YouTube to see what's up. That's not a thing that, um, that's a thing that could be a lot bigger. And so it's a thing that, we're, that I particularly focus on uh, at YouTube. Um, so we work on a lot of these different kind of genre areas as well as kind of what's popular overall on YouTube to help find all the things that people would like to watch. Um, and this is kind of an interesting challenge because technology is really changing how we discover and watch entertainment news, education, music, all kinds of things. And the number of things we can now watch is at a, a scale that is unprecedented uh, of any time before. And the number of people who are creating those things and the types of people who create those things are also um, changing completely. And so by using data and, and tracking different, what we call it cultural phenomenon, uh, we're working really hard to understand what's popular and not just what's popular, but also why those things are popular. And you know, when I think about it, you know, YouTube and web technologies have really fundamentally changed um, our global culture in a lot of these very irreversible ways. And so, you know, I get the luxury of tackling a lot of these problems with some of the smartest people that I've ever met. And Google's a very innovative place for that reason. There's very smart people there. It's this culture of, of inspiration that where it's accept acceptable to test things, to learn things. Um, and there's a real commitment to challenging the status quo, to challenging how things were done before. And because of that, um, there are all kinds of exciting opportunities when you work at a place like YouTube and Google to be an industry, you know, have le industry leadership and thought leadership. So um, a separate part of my job is that I'm kind of like the expert in viral video stuff. Um, so, you know, I kind of like play this weird role at YouTube where we have all these projects that we're working on, but also like personally I'm kind of our researcher, historian almost, for a, which is funny, historian for something that's been around for eight years. Um, but sort of our sort of thought leader in how viral behavior works and, and web video culture. And so, um, you know, I, I have this TED talk about how videos go viral that um, has a lot of views and I get to go around and speak at different tech and culture conferences, which is one of the coolest parts of my job. Um, two weeks ago, I mean, sometimes they're really silly, like, you know, maybe design conferences or something. And then two weeks ago, I was in Oslo speaking at the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is where human rights activists um, go to uh, share uh, the things that they're working on from different parts of the world. So a lot of these different technologies touch people in, in very unique and different ways. Um, I'm also a uh, like, person who goes on TV to explain why the Harlem Shake is popular um, <laughs> and various things. Uh, this is the part of my job that my mom really loves. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I've done kind of all the morning shows and stuff. I have also get to travel to a lot of different countries. This is from when I was giving a talk in Tel Aviv. Um, and it's interesting because you know, YouTube is truly not uh, a U.S. thing. It's, it's a global thing. Uh, I, was in, I mentioned I was in Norway last week talking to people about how the biggest video of the year last year was the, um, was the Fox, which was a Norwegian video, actually. So it's kind of interesting to talk to all these people in different places about, uh, about how they use uh, things like YouTube um, in, as part of their daily lives. Um, and so all this is very cool. Uh, don't get me wrong. But then, earlier this year, this happened. Confident going in that we're going to whoop some butt. Welcome back, everyone. You might notice the job is back Yay. with us to see what viral marketing madness you have spawned. And we're also joined by two executives from YouTube and from their team. That's our right. For YouTube, <laughs> Kate Mason, who is on the uh, YouTube communications team. Welcome, YouTubers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, I cannot even cook uh, at all, and I was a celebrity judge on a cooking show on the Food Network. Uh, it's a food show called Food Network Star, uh, and uh, if this doesn't make any sense to you, it makes even less sense to me, um, so you're not alone. So I've decided to alternately title today's talk, um, How to Accidentally Become a Judge on the Food Network. Okay, so. Now we're gonna go, I wanna go back in time to when I was at BC. This is a, a photo from when I lived on South Street. Um, 
So this guy on the, on the left is my, uh, was my roommate, uh, Kevin Armstrong. Um, we, in this photo, we're dressed as each other for some reason. So um, he's, I'm from Florida, he's wearing my Hurricanes hat. Uh, and um, and we, this is when we were, this is like fall of 2004. Uh, so this is, uh, we've, we've remained very close friends. He's actually still my roommate to this day in New York City. Um, and, uh, and we've had very interesting, sort of very different career paths. So I'm going to, first of all, talk about the other Kevin. Um, and this is actually a better photo that he would prefer I used of him, probably. Uh, and so Kevin, um, when he, uh, we're in, we're in, we met maybe freshman year of, of uh, uh, at BC, we were living in Hardy and Newton before they renovated it. It was the last building to be renovated, I think. Um, and, uh, and from the first year of, of college, Kevin knew he wanted to be a sports writer. He's like, it's what I want to do. I'm going like, to do all the things I need to do to be a sports writer. So he started as he was a sports editor of the Heights. He, took an inter he was an intern at the Boston Globe. And then uh, when we moved to New York, uh, when he moved to New York, he uh, became a fact checker for Sports Illustrated, and then he was, a, uh, he was at Sports Illustrated kind of covering recruiting and high school stuff. Uh, left Sports Illustrated, was working at the New York Times covering college sports, and then for the last um, four and a half years, he's been at the Daily News, um, where he's kind of their pro football guy. The, he does features, um, specifically covers the Jets, but he covers a lot of different things. He's done, I think, like seven US Opens at this point, um, two Super Bowls, the Olympics, um, you know, he's done a lot of features, he's covered a lot of Aaron Hernandez stuff. Um, but anyways, just like did all the things that he exactly wanted to do and he'll probably um, keep, you know, do, keep on this path until he like starts writing books, like because that's what you do when you're kind of uh, an editorial person like this. Um, so that, that's, that's Kevin, right? Okay, then there's me, this is Jamoke. Um, and uh, so now while, um, other Kevin was, was actually lining up his life and his career, and he did, you know, he was set up. He had a job at Sports Illustrated lined up for him right when he graduated. Um, I was, uh, you know, getting into trouble. Um, I was a common film major, which uh, also questionable career prospects sometimes. Um, and then also uh, I was the director of Hello Shovel, which is how I spent most of my time. Uh, Dean Hughes is here, uh, and she'll remember this, but um, I, we got into trouble once, like for the same time that Kevin was a sports editor, I was like, uh, we had sort of made fun of Father Leahy in a way that was a little over the line, and so we got put on probation for a year. We couldn't, we couldn't make fun of, you know, the administration for a while, and then the year the, the, <clears throat> the, the thing got lifted, um, we decided we're going we're gonna to make an action movie about, about Father Leahy, and <laughs> that way he can't possibly get mad about this because he'll be in an, an action movie. And so we made um, The League of Extraordinary Jesuits. Can you hear this? Oh, there we go. Critics are raving about the league. People, Time, and Newsweek all agree LXJ is one of the year's best films. <laughs> USA Today proclaims terrorism doesn't stand a chance when you've got heroes like the league. Roger E. warns this film So uh, this is what I was doing, um, and I, I, just so you have some hope, uh, despite this sort of idiocy of what we were doing, uh, everyone here has, uh, has found successful careers, uh, specifically that nun uh, over there is uh, my good friend Molly McAleer, who uh, is, um, she co-founded Hell Giggles and is one of the writers on Two Broke Girls. Um, so everybody kind of worked out, I guess, but anyways. Um, Back to this. So uh, in addition to these things, I was also the humor columnist of the Heights. Uh, I did uh, an internship with uh, the Miss Florida USA pageant. Um, I had a, there was a greeting card company called Blue Mountain Arts. I did an internship with them for a summer. Uh, I was doing documentary film stuff. Um, there's no pattern to any of this, clearly. Um, that was part of the problem. So I d even did a thing at the Career Center called Career Makeovers, which was for people who had no idea what they were doing. Um, and that's, that's how, I, I'm, how I met Janet and um, how I ended up, uh, you know, sort of 
getting one of the internships that I had and, and sort of trying to figure out what I was going to do. So I, anyways, I, I, through all this, I said, you know what, I, I really want to do comedy. Like I have enough things in here. I was like loving the comedy stuff. I really wanted to be a comedy writer. And that's what I wanted to do. So I was like, I'm going to move to LA. That's what you got to do when you want to be a comedy writer. I'm going to move to LA, try to get a job as a comedy writer. So that's why I ended up in New York. Um, <laughs> because I could not even follow the one plan that I had, which was to go to LA. Um, and actually, this is not entirely true. I actually uh, did a pit stop for five months in Hollywood, Florida at my parents' house, um, where I uh, drove my mother crazy uh, until she was like, you need to go somewhere. So uh, I moved to... Uh, I moved to New York and I had, I had about five months of rent saved up that I could cover. I was like, I can get through about, which is not, which is saying a lot because New York rent is expensive. Um, and so it was Kevin and then our other friend from Shovelhead, George, we moved in this apartment in New York and I had five months and I had to, I, once I hit five months, it was going to get hairy. I couldn't necessarily cover my rent. I was going to have to maybe like try to borrow money from my parents or something and, and you know, I didn't want to end up having to do that. So I spent, uh, I, I, did, I did some freelance stuff and I spent hours search, scouring for jobs. Like every website that had jobs, I was scouring it, trying to find people who would meet with me. I once responded to a job listing called Batman Seeking Robin. Like it was like every kind of random thing possible. Um, I was shooting some B-roll and then I would just, this is a, an excerpt of one day from my Gmail inbox that I went and found, um, of one day's worth of emails that I was just like sending out. Like it was, I mean, it was like every night I would get frantic and I'd be like, okay, you can see like assistant, associate producer, you know, all this stuff. Um, that I was applying to. And then there's this one here, which ended up being the one that w ended up being my first job. It was an internship that I had applied for. Now, I had been applying for jobs through Craigslist, which is, seems quite inadvisable uh, right now, um, because you think of Craigslist, you think of like job listings like this, um, which I thought was pretty good. Um, or this is, this, is actually, this is my favorite. When I was researching, this is my favorite one that I found. Um, I like that the hourly rate is negotiable for, for that. Um, you know, but actually there, there was this, uh, I found a job that wasn't totally bizarre. Uh, there was a, uh, a website that was starting up, um, and, well there's a, a sort of somewhat established website that was launching a new startup within it. That website was, the larger website was the Huffington Post and the uh, website they were launching was called 23.6. It was going to be this uh, political satire website. Um, and. It, this is what it looked like. It was called 23.6. The tagline was some of the news most of the time. Um, and it was amazing. Like, it, was, it was so cool. I started as an, a paid intern and then ended up becoming like, an editorial assistant and working my way up to associate editor. The, like, all the writers on there were from Letterman, from The Daily Show. It was, it was, like, it was my dream, essentially. Um, and uh, you know, we would uh, go in every day, like, pitch jokes about the news, write things. I was the uh, editor of a Wikipedia parody website that was called Dickopedia, um, <laughs> where you'd write articles about how people were uh, were dicks, essentially. Um, and um, and then uh, you know I also used to produce videos and do Photoshop and like basically any possible thing that they wanted. Um, we we created the, I created this series called In a Minute, um, which was where we take these news clips and mash them up um, together. So. Uh, I'm going to tell one specific story of this. Uh, so one afternoon, it was September in 2008, and uh, the stock market was just in this total downward spiral, and like all the news networks were freaking out. The government was announcing all these the, the bailout, and, and CNN had an anchor named Rick Sanchez at the desk, um, and he had a very memorable day. I remember watching him sort of cover this like incredible news, and um, so we turned this into what, you know, now, I, now the term supercut is, thrown, like, is kind of what it's called, like when you mash up found footage clips, but we were one of the first people to ever really do that, with, especially with new stuff, um, and, uh, and basically invented that. Uh, here is that clip. Tom Rick Sanchez, the market is tanking. Financial crisis, I'm looking over and oh boy, oh boy, we're having this, oh my God. Who in the hell, where in the world, where in the heck? Hey, look at what's on me. Hola, Rico, ¿cómo está? Buenas tardes. It is, Tom Rick. We're in the control room if we can. Michael, in the control room. I think you can go down, Michael, to our Twitter board. Let's go over to Twitter now. See, we can put the Twitter board back up. If you happen to have an internet close by, it's different, it's interactive. And I've gotten a lot of... Uh, uh, tweets as well. We're going to check on some of the tweets. Thousand, fifteen, sixteen thousand, almost fifteen thousand people who are tweeting with us. My Twitter board's about to explode here. Right, let's go to my Facebook page. MySpace, <laughs> Facebook, the Lehman fallout. Lehman story. Lehman, the next domino to fall. AIG. AIG. Who is AIG? AIG. <laughs> AIG. 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 
says one, two, three, wrong girl. A I G, 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 A I G. Speaking of A I G, A I G. Why is A I G so important? Right now we're looking at the Dow. A little square there, right? Oops, wait, right there. See it? Right about there. A little while ago, I was down just right there where Susan Silvich's uh, chest area is. It's up 28, just went back to 286, and we go under 400. The market just stopped 400. What, what's it at right now? Tell me in my ear. It's at 350 right now. Thanks, Michael. That's a problem. That might be a problem. That's not good. <laughs> it's a very important announcement. The Fed, really just about uh, any moment now. We're waiting, and we're going to take a quick break now. Let's try and sneak a break in here. If we're in the break, we're going to stand by. All right, here we go. We just uh, received uh, the decision to not lower interest rates. Not. Not, Ixe, Nixe, no. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? What, what's, what's, what is going on? What's going on? What are the markets doing? What are you talking about? Whoa, 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 Okay, I am totally confused by what you're saying. <laughs> we'll be back. This was, my, this was my dream job, essentially, was doing this. Um, and so, you know, I learned so much. I learned about pop culture and how inter the internet dynamics worked uh, around editorial content and editorial management. Um, you know, I was working with these very smart people. A lot of great comedians um, were there at that time who were up and coming at the moment. A lot of the guys who work on Bob's Burgers now, that whole crew, they used to work there. Um, it, was, it was great. And I uh, got promoted while I was there. It was, it was my dream job. Uh, and then about two years later, we all got laid off. And I was, like, totally crushed. Um, and I used to... Like, it was applying for jobs, I was doing some freelancing. I used to wander around the Met because uh, I needed something to do during the day. I would try to pick up girls in this Greek sculpture garden uh, <laughs> thing. And, um, and, you know, I was collecting my, I was, we, we got severance, so it wasn't terrible, but I was, it was, I was unhappy uh, as a person. And so I was freelancing, I was scouring for jobs, and that whole economic crisis that Rick Sanchez was talking about was not good for my prospects of getting a new job. So eventually I found my way to a site called Media Bistro, um, which is a, a really great resource if you want to work in the media industry. Um, and landed on my, my feet there. I, I had spent so much time writing jokes about the news that I actually learned a lot about the news uh, at the time. And so they, I hired me to be a beat reporter to cover the television news industry. So I'd interview journalists and network executives and things. Um, I used to host an interview show called Media Beat. And, and I also, like, they let me host this Mad Men recap show that was, like, kind of a comedy thing they let me do. But I made a ton of connections through that job. And I did that for a year and, you know, was really learning so much about how the media business worked. Um, but it, it just, it really wasn't a great fit for me. I'm not a, a very good reporter, it turns out. Um, and I got really sick of dealing with PR people and stuff. So I just would start applying for jobs late at night to feel better about myself. And then I'd go back to work and kind of forgot that I had done that. And then... Um, like one year into this job, uh, I accepted another job and everything changed. And that is uh, when I got the call that I would, was getting a job at Google. Um, and so this was about four years after I had graduated. And I had started this job at this place that I had really only dreamed about. My closest connection, I was ta talking about this earlier, my closest connection with Google was that I had had a friend who had had lunch with someone that they were friends with at Google. That was like the closest I had been uh, to Google. And here I was starting there. And my specific job was to be an expert on YouTube. Um, and, you know, I think it was this, this bizarre thing of, I'm going to get to, go to, I'm get to go to Google and, and learn about YouTube. And, you know, we're in this, these famous Google offices with all this. This is actually not a joke. That's the head of PR for YouTube going down the slide in the YouTube office. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the truth was that I had, um, the, the, it's, it's this great culture there where it lets very intelligent people be able to do big things. And I happened to have the only two things they, two of, I happened to have two specific things they needed at that moment, which was somebody who knew a lot about how the media industry worked and somebody who knew a lot about pop culture. And so we launched a site called YouTube Trends that was designed to like sort of help people and journalists get more um, into YouTube and understand the things that were popular on the site. Um, and uh, it fit because those were two things I was also very passionate about. And, um, and I started on the news and politics team, and it was an incredible time to be starting at YouTube because um, with, within six months of me starting, the Arab Spring began. Um, and I remember we were sitting at our desks in New York watching uh, when uh, everything started to get really hairy into Rear Square, and everybody started uploading all their videos, and we were helping the news networks find this stuff. Uh, we worked on a, uh, a, a, one of the GOP primary debates. We got to go down to, to Orlando and, and um, do the CNN or the uh, Fox News Google uh, debate. I even got to meet the president uh, as a part of it. And this is a photo of him telling us about his favorite YouTube video, which is why we're all just like, ah, so excited. <laughs> um, 
And uh, you know, as my role changed, I got to meet all kinds of cool people. I interviewed Dwayne Wade uh, when he came. I interviewed Taylor Swift. Uh, this is me not knowing exactly how to appropriately greet Taylor Swift on stage. <laughs> Um, I got to meet I got to meet a lot of like random viral internet stars, which is still some of my favorite things. This is Tron guy. This is one of my favorite people to hang out with. We've hung out a couple of times. Uh, you may know him as this guy. Oh my God! Full on double rainbow all the way across the sky. <laughs> And you know, I, I have to say, one of the reasons I like seeing him is that at many days when I'm at work, I actually feel like him. I feel like this. I feel this like total excitement. I felt, uh, you know, like I could fight a robot, which I did in 2013 briefly uh, for our like uh, Geek Week thing. You know, all kinds of crazy stuff. I've gotten to travel around the world and um, be a spokesperson in um, newspapers in Israel and um, and uh, Brazil and, and Sweden. Uh, I even spotted this in a uh, in a market in Jerusalem, um, which was like it's, it was like it, it was there to remind me how I got uh, how I got there in the first place. So um, I've had a lot of iterations at my job at YouTube. Uh, you know, obviously explain some of the things I'm working on now. Um, and um, you know, it's interesting because I have no technical background. I have an editorial background essentially. But most people uh, who work at YouTube think a lot of people who, who work at YouTube. I actually think that I, um, I have a technical background because I understand a lot about how our technology works and uh, I work on a lot of collaborative projects with engineers and different people in different parts of the company. Uh, other people think that I'm a creative director because of the work on things like Rewind. Um, and so even now, this far into my career, I do not consider myself a part of any specific discipline exactly. Uh, my dad uh, just tells people when they, when they ask what I do that he's, he just says, oh, he's just Kevin. At, at YouTube, he's, he's, that's his job title. Is he's Kevin, um, and uh, and also that I know Giada De Laurentiis um, from that um, uh, from the uh, from the Food Network thing. But um, you know, I think so. If we go back to that question, actually, um, I told you like literally how I ended up uh, doing the um, how I ended up kind of at Google and getting to be on the Food Network. Um, but the sort of whole point of the non-traditional career path is that they're non-traditional, and so they're very hard. It's very hard to replicate. You couldn't possibly do the same exact steps that I did to end up at Google. Like that's just a bizarre chain of events. Uh, and that's kind of how it works for a lot of people. So these are my five uh, important realizations, I guess. Um, and um, I, tried to, I tried to think of some, some non-cliche thoughts <laughs> uh, about how I think this stuff works. So here, here we go. So the first thing is, um, for, for me specifically, uh, I've always found that having a 10-year plan, which is a lot of things that especially people who work in, in the business world feel very adamant about, does not make sense. Actually, a five-year plan does not even make sense for me. Um, most of the jobs I've had didn't exist before I had them. I was the first culture and trends, at, you know, head of culture and trends at, at YouTube. Uh, I don't know what will happen next, but um, you know, they were the, the, none of these things existed when I was in college. Uh, and I've, only one time ever filled in for somebody, I've ever taken over a job from somebody else who left. Um, if this is what YouTube looked like when I graduated, um, which is kind of fun. It seems like it was like so ancient, but this is like only eight years ago. Um, and this is, uh, this is what uh, Facebook looked like. There was no news feed. Like news feed did not exist yet. Um, and it was only available at certain colleges. And um, the, so the idea of social media did not really exist uh, at all. Like this, Interestingly, Reddit looks basically the same uh, as it did then. But um, none of these websites existed uh, at that time. And um, social media wasn't really a term in 2006, um, which is only eight years ago, right? Like, there's, we're here talking about careers in social media and things. That, that's a, that word did not, that term really did not exist popularly uh, at that time when I graduated from school. And now it's this massive industry that's kind of fundamentally changed a lot of the ways that we behave. And uh, so, I uh, don't think of, and I, I have a team now that I manage, and we talk about career development even with them. And you know, I don't think about a job plan like I'm going to do this job, and then I'm going to do this job, and then I'm going to do this job. Like for other Kevin, that works out pretty great. Like it's worked out very nicely. But um, for me, that's not the thing. Like I, I actually think it's more useful to have a, like a skills plan. Think about the things you want to grow and the and the ways that you want to enhance your your skill set. Uh, and towards like larger career goals, like things you actually want to be spending your life doing. We spend so, 
you will spend so much time at work, right? So much of your time of your life will be spent at work. If you're not, if you don't like what you're doing, or you're not passionate about what you're doing, it could be very, very difficult to be spending all that time. And so I think it's important to have larger career goals and have this, to be thinking about the skills that can get you towards those goals. But going like, I'm going to do this job and then this, and then I'm going to be that in 10 years, doesn't really make sense for me at least, and I think for a lot of people. The other thing is, um, is trying to play to your strengths. A lot of people will say like, you should be super well-rounded and you should like, be trying out all kinds of different things and, and getting broad expertise. I think that there is some, there's definitely value to that, but I think um, developing the talents and skills of the things you're already good at is more important than trying to be good at everything. Um, and a lot of people who are, are very um, powerful executives or senior executives at different companies will actually give you this, this same advice. Um, there's a time to be broad and there's a time to build deep expertise in a professional area once you kind of uh, settle in. Um, and the professional world in general is really about making decisions and career development is about making decisions about opportunities. Um, and for, for me it's always been about being very, trying to be very quick and very smart about those things. Um, you have to put yourself in a position essentially to be presented with opportunities and be open to opportunities. And I think importantly you need to give yourself runway for those opportunities to present themselves. So I mentioned I had those five months, right? I gave myself the five month runway to do it. Other people have done this completely differently, uh, where they've taken a job that was going to pay the bills while they were doing something else in their free time, or they've uh, taken a job that, they, um, that was somewhat related, um, that they knew would get them to a certain point, and then they would kind of move on, they'd look for that opportunity for the next thing. Um, and so like part of that, is, part of that is, is financial. You have to give yourself some financial runway essentially to be able to do the things you want to do if they're not immediately present to you. Um, so, so part of that's like saving up and taking these odd jobs and things. And then the other part is to give yourself actual mental runway to say, okay, I'm going to give myself a chance to do this thing. I think a lot of times we bail on ideas because we don't have connections or we don't know people yet. And so we bail on those things. But you have to actually give yourself a chance to be open to those things and, and put yourself in a position to have those opportunities. Um, the fourth thing is that I feel strongly that not all skills uh, are the same. Um, and that, you know, I mentioned before about sort of developing the skills and talents of things that you're good at is, is very important. Um, but, you know, this is, a, this is a laundry list of some of the things that I need to have some basic understanding of every day. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very broad list of things. Um, and I only took, uh, these are the only ones that I had classes in, in college, um, specific classes. And then the law one is highlighted, but I took one semester of law. So that's like kind of a stretch. Um, and I took one class, I actually took one class in any sort of technology thing. I took this World Wide Web and digital media class that ended up being incredibly valuable because they taught us how to do HTML stuff at the time. And that was useful because when I needed to go work at the Huffington Post, I needed to know how to code, you know, basic stuff like HTML. Really, it's really simple, but it ended up being very valuable. But the rest of this stuff, I never really took any courses in. Um, but, you know, when I think about the things that I actually need to leverage every day uh, in, in my job, independent of what project I'm working on, it's these. It's persuasive communication, it's leadership, it's developing organized and structured arguments, research, like academic curiosity. These are all things that are leveraged all the time for me, and none of which will be in a job description of a job that you're applying for. Um, but they're all, interestingly, uh, things you coincidentally get as part of a, uh, a Jesuit liberal arts education. So that was helpful. Um, and that's even true for film majors. Um, and so that's a hooray for liberal arts education. Um, this is the Georgia Tech uh, dude. Uh, I'm not sure you saw that video. Um, and, you know, the, I can't, uh, amongst those things, I can't tell you enough for my job specifically how important the ability to communicate has become. Um, and that's, not something you think of when you think about a tech company, but it's incredibly important um, in, in any kind of business, particularly tech. Um, and oddly, when I think back to um, some of the most valuable things I did while I was in school, being the director of a sketch comedy group like Hello Shovelhead was one of the most valuable things I ever did because you learn people management, you learn scheduling and deadlines, and also I learned like basic writing and performance and communication skills. And it's kind of strange that the Father Leahy League of Extraordinary Jesuits thing would lead to that, but it's true that I think about that all the time, actually. And I, you know, you don't say that that often, but when you actually reflect on it, it's it's very true. Um, the other thing I want to stress today is that there are other pe the other thing that I've kind of realized that you're not the only one doing a weird career path, actually. And I think at BC, bec and I, I remember this 
you know, I'm going back to when I was a senior, I had friends who were going to be accountants or they were going to be, you know, my sister, she's a teacher, she knew what she was going to do. Um, and, you know, it was like there was this thing that they were going to clearly like, you know, they were maybe getting recruited or they had a job lined up at, out of campus. It felt like, oh man, I'm the one guy who doesn't know what the hell he's doing and I got to go to like live in Florida and then whatever, you know. And um, I'm certainly, you know, now in retrospect, I'm definitely not some isolated example of a person who didn't know what they were doing and then ended up with a really interesting job. Um, these uh, four, these three job titles uh, are people are jobs at, at YouTube that uh, were all um, Boston College graduates actually that I met once I got there. So our former head of UX, um, our head of news partnerships now, our operations manager for the Next Lab, all BC grads. None of them I think studied uh, tech related things when they were in school. Um, these are um, these these jobs are people who I, I went to college with and am very good, was very good friends with in college and all have super cool and interesting jobs um, and also took very strange and unusual career paths. So, you know, I think the hardest thing about about when when I was asked to sort of speak about um, you know what it's like trying to navigate an unconventional career path, the the hardest part is actually. Um, the commitment to just sort of being strong and, and, and doing what interests you. Um, I think I've su succeeded at YouTube um, because I'm really fascinated by the problems and the challenges that we're facing um, that we're trying to solve every day. And uh, you know, it's, it's, I can't tell you how, like, when I tell this to people uh, who have been working the same amount of time as I have, and I say I've been at Google for four years and I've never been bored at work once in those four years. That's an incredible, that's an incredible thing. Um, and it's something that you know I never thought that I would be able to have in, in, in my life, but I ended up there. And um, that can be getting there can be very scary, and it can be very stressful, and it can be very difficult. Um, but I think the one of the more important things I kind of was able to get indirectly through my time at BC was was the confidence in my abilities, um, because it's very easy to give up on things when you don't have that. And I think when I say confidence, I don't mean like the kind of like oh you just need to feel good about what you're doing, and you know people. Will, you know, the kind of confidence you get when your parents are like, oh, you're going to be great. You know, that's like, there's, there's that kind of confidence, which is, is great and important. But there's also, I think, earned confidence that's earned through real life experience. And for me, it was things like the book that I was able to write because of that random, you know, program that I did at the Career Center because I got this internship for the summer or being on stage and doing stuff in Shovelhead or, you know, getting paid as an editorial assistant to write jokes. Like that was like, oh, somebody's going to pay me to do this. That was, that's real confidence that is meaningful because you've actually, it's a, like sort of your career telling you you're going, you're doing the right things. And you know, there's, you have to be okay at the same time with things not working out. Um, and at least half the time they certainly will not. Um, I mean, I told you I had my favorite job and then got laid off. Like it, it was not cool. Um, but it uh, is a thing that kind of like I reflect on now as an important part of my like process to getting to where I am because then if I hadn't done that maybe I would have stayed being a comedy writer and frankly a lot of comedy writers aren't happy people sometimes so you know it's like things can go a lot of different ways um, and you know at the same time if you do things just the right way this could be you <laughs> there.